Hi everyone, uh, thank you for joining us on this webinar today. We'd like to welcome you to the next installment of the OSC's Registrant Outreach Seminar. Uh, today's topic will be the Capital Markets Participation Fee Calculation. Uh, I'd just like to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Jonathan Young. I'm an accountant on the registration team of the Compliance and Registrant Regulation Branch of the OSC. Um, as we approach the December 1st deadline for the filing of the participation fee calculation, uh, this presentation will assist you to complete your calculations and hopefully pay your fees on time. Uh, largely, this is a repeat of last year's seminar, but we'll go through the amendments that were uh, imp implemented this year, and hopefully this presentation will be a good refresher for everyone. Uh, this presentation will be approximately one hour long. If you do have any questions at the end of the presentation, uh, you can email the registrant outreach email and we will respond back as soon as possible. Hopefully you'll find this presentation useful. Uh, so before we start, we just want to go through a general disclaimer. Uh, I won't go through all of it in detail, you can read it, but in general, uh, this presentation doesn't constitute legal or accounting advice, and we do provide some examples in this presentation, and the examples are only for illustration purposes only. And I'll leave the rest of the slide for you to read. In terms of our agenda today, uh, what we'll go through is just a general overview of the OSC fee rule and how it applies to all the firms. Uh, we'll go through a summary of the amendments that were made to the OSC fee rule, which is OSC rule 13502, along with the companion policy, which is a guidance on the fees rule. And these amendments came into force April 6, 2015. Uh, next, we'll go through the filing requirements for all verbs with regards to the filing and the payment of the capital markets participation fee. Uh, we'll put it all together, including the amendments, and we'll show you how it fits. Uh, we'll go through a walkthrough of the actual calculation itself, which is Form 13502F4, along with common errors that we typically see. Uh, before we provide you with a link to the references. We'll discuss an update with regards to the Cooperative Capital Markets Regulatory System and how, um, how it affects you in terms of the fees. Uh, so now we'll just go through a general overview of the OSC fees and how it impacts your firm. So OSC collects fees and all of the fees are outlined in OSC Rule 13502 uh, for registered firms and any firms relying on an exemption from registration under the Ontario Securities Act. And there's also a fees rule with respect to uh, the Commodities Futures Act. Uh, in terms of the OSC fee structure, uh, the fees are designed to cover the costs that the OSC incurs. Uh, typically, there are two main types of fees. The first one is activity fees, and this is a specific fee that is charged for a particular filing of a document or form. And the purpose of the activity fee is to cover the cost of the commission reviewing these types of documents. Uh, examples of these activity, these forms and documents that are subject to an activity fee include reviewing prospectuses, registration applications, applications for discretionary exemptive relief, and uh, there is a specific fee for each type of these filings. The second bucket of fees is called participation fees, and these are fees for a variety of regulatory services that are not attributable to a particular filing or a document, and this covers everything else. Um, there are four main types of participation fees. I've only listed two here. Uh, the first one is corporate finance participation fees, and these are for reporting issuers. Um, these issuers have to calculate participation fee using a uh, capitalization method. Uh, the next one is capital markets participation fees for registered firms and certain unregistered capital markets participants that are relying on an exemption from registration. Uh, this is the purpose of our presentation today, and we'll be discussing capital markets participation fees. The other two Categories of participation fees are specified regulated entities. Uh, these are exchanges, alternative trading systems, clearing agencies, and trade repositories. Um, the last one is designated rating organizations participation fees. Uh, 
Uh, now, in terms of the types of firms that are required to pay and calculate capital markets participation fees, uh, they include the following bucket of firms. Uh, so if your firm is registered under the Securities Act as an advisor, dealer, investment fund manager, or under the Commodities Futures Act as a commodity trading manager, etc., cetera, uh, you're required to pay, calculate and pay participation fees on an annual basis. Uh, if your firm is relying on an exemption from registration, uh, is specifically Section 8.18 and 8.26 of National Instrument 31103. These are your foreign exempt international dealers and international advisors. You are also required to calculate and pay fees. And lastly, uh, firms that are considered unregistered investment fund managers. So these firms are exempt from, from the investment fund manager registration. Um, and these types of firms are defined in the fee rule under Section 1.1. Lastly, there's another group of firms. Um, if your firm is exempt from registration by way of a director's decision or a commission order that requires you, as part of the terms and conditions of that order, to calculate and pay fees or follow the requirements under the OSC fee rule, you are also, your firm is also required to calculate and pay fees. Uh, so as most of you are aware, uh, the fee rule was amended this year. And in this next set of slides, we'll talk about the amendments that affect your capital markets participation fee calculation. So the amendments came into effect earlier this year in April 6, uh, 2015. Uh, what the OSC did was they re-examined the fee structure a little bit earlier than intended in order to consider issues that were raised by market participants with respect to fees and the participation fee calculation itself. Um, so based on these uh, these comments and additional considerations, the OSC um, implemented uh, amendments April 6th. Uh, the amendments to OSC Rule 13503, which is the Commodity Futures Act rule, was also amended along with the companion policy, which provides guidance. And these amendments were made to mirror essentially OSC Rule 13502 and the companion policy for that. Um, so we'll go into specific types of amendments that affect the participation fee calculation. Uh, the first one is the reference fiscal year. Uh, as most of you are probably aware, in prior years, a firm was required to calculate the participation fees based on a fiscal year ending prior to May 1st, 2012. So in most cases, firms were required to calculate using a 2011 or early 2012 financial year. Uh, this concept has now been removed, and now registered firms and unregistered capital markets participants have to use the previous financial year, and the previous financial year is defined as the financial year of the firm ending in the then current calendar year. So what that means is the financial year that the firm has to use is based off the financial year ending in 2015 for the 2015 year. So for this year's calculation, all firms need to calculate based on your 2015 financial year. Uh, similarly, for next year, for 2016, all firms should calculate fees based on your financial year ending in 2016. And the advantage of this uh, amendment is that fees are more closely tracked to the current market conditions of of the firms. So if a firm has a better year, the firm will be paying participation fees off of that better year, whereas previously they would be paying off of 2011 for something that was, say, in 2014. Uh, the next amendment is with regards to the definition of capital markets activity. So the way the calculation works is um, the firm records all reports all revenues for the firm um, and backs out any activities that are not considered capital markets activities. Um, what we, what the amendments were made to do is to clarify the language, and specifically, capital markets activities fits into three buckets. So in our current language, capital markets activities means activities for which registration is required. So if a firm is registered as a dealer, advisor, investment fund manager, if you're an IROC member, MFDA member, all those activities that require you to be registered are captured. Uh, the next bucket is any activities for which an exemption from registration is required under the Act or under the Commodities Futures Act. And these types of activities are also considered capital markets activities. And lastly, um, 
This definition captures any activities that would require registration or an exemption from registration if those activities were carried on in Ontario. So what we mean by that is, uh, for example, with foreign, uh, foreign firms, U.S. firms that are advisors uh, and registered with the SEC or FINRA, uh, those advising activities may require registration with the SEC or uh, FINRA, but it might not require registration in Ontario. However, if those activities were in Ontario, it would require registration. And in those cases, these types of activities are also required to be captured. Uh, the previous language is outlined below, and uh, we'll explain what the amendments were meant to do. Uh, in terms of the amendments, uh, this was made to address common errors that firms were deducting anything that was not Ontario related on the, the second line where it indicates deducting revenues that are not attributable to capital markets activities. So now the definition um, captures all of these types of activities and when your firm goes down to the Ontario percentage, that's the section where you reduce the allocation to just Ontario revenues. Uh, in terms of the definition, we removed the reference to IFMs uh, because IFMs are already captured and required to be registered, so automatically those activities are considered capital markets activities. So we removed that reference completely. Uh, the next amendment was with regards to the Ontario percentage. Um, so the current language, uh, it was simplified and clarified so that your firm will fit under one of three buckets in order to determine what your Ontario percentage is. Uh, the first case is if your firm has a permanent establishment in Ontario only in the last financial year and no permanent established elsewhere, you're required to use 100% and report all your revenues relating to Ontario. Uh, an example of permanent establishment would be an office or a branch. Uh, this definition is defined uh, at the beginning of the OSC fee rule, so if you refer to section 1.1, you'll see all of the definitions. Um, the second set of firms with regards to the Ontario percentage is if your firm has a permanent establishment in Ontario and you also have a permanent establishment elsewhere, whether it's in another province or territory or in the U.S., what you would do is you would determine your Ontario percentage based on the taxable income that is taxable income earned in the year in Ontario. Um, so you would take your Ontario taxable income and divide it by your firm-wide taxable income. Uh, the last bucket of firms is if your firm does not have a permanent establishment in Ontario at all, uh, what we, you would use is uh, your revenues as the base to calculate your Ontario percentage. So you would take your uh, revenue earned in Ontario divided by your total firm revenue in order to obtain the Ontario percentage. And again, the Ontario percentage was uh, meant to simplify and clarify the definition. Um, it removed certain terms, uh, such as the Ontario allocation factor, and these terms were are referenced in the Tax Act, tax act and it re users that were reading the definition had to go to the Tax Act in order to determine how to calculate the Ontario percentage. So we removed that and specifically identified the three scenarios how your firm would fit. Uh, the next one is the filing requirements uh, for unregistered IFMs. Um, so previously, the filing requirements and the payment requirements for unregistered IFMs was due within 90 days after the firm's financial year end. Uh, there was no policy reason to have the deadlines different than registered firms and other exempt firms. So the amendment was made to align these uh, deadline dates. So now the filing deadline for unregistered IFMs is December 1st, and the fee payment deadline is December 31st, which coincides with every other firm. In terms of who certifies the participation fee calculation, uh, previous language required two members of senior management to attest to the completeness of the calculation and the accuracy of the calculation. Uh, however, we have changed the, the language to now require the chief compliance officer um, to certify and attest to the completeness and accuracy of the participation fee calculation. Uh, in cases where a CCO, a firm doesn't have a CCO, it would be the individual that's acting in a similar capacity. Uh, this new requirement is outlined in section 3.3 of the fee rule. And uh, in some cases, previously, firms would use the CFO to provide 
a review and sign off on it. But now um, if the C CFO does want to provide initial review, they still can. However, the CCO is the one that's responsible for monitoring and assessing the firm's compliance with securities law. And as a result, we still require the CCO to ultimately sign off on the participation fee calculation. Uh, there were some amendments that were made to the late fees uh, in the fee rule, and this is with regards to Appendix D of the OSC Rule 13502. And there are three main amendments which affect participation fees, and I'll outline them below for you. So the first one is with respect to unregistered IFMs and the late filing fee. So previously under the, the old fee rule, Unregistered IFMs were not subject to a late filing fee where an unregistered IFM files a participation fee late. Again, there was no policy reason to um, to have it different than all of the registered and other exempt firms. So as a result, now unregistered IFMs are required to pay a late filing fee if the participation fee calculation is late. Uh, the second uh, amendment is with regards to the maximum late fee that can be charged to a firm in a, a year. Uh, previously, it, it was a maximum of 5000 for all firms. Uh, this has changed to 10000 for certain types of firms. And if your firm had specified Ontario revenues last year of greater than or equal to $500 million, the your firm's late fee maximum is 10000 instead of 5000 And the last amendments with regards to uh, late fees and amounts that are less than $100. So um, in some cases, uh, participation fees that are paid late are subject to late fees and they end up being less than $100. As a result, uh, OSC is not going to levy a late fee if this fee is less than $100. Uh, the companion policy which provides guidance with respect to the fee rule uh, was amended as well to uh, s uh, clarify the no refund section and in terms of section 2.7 of the companion policy, it indicates uh, that in general, we will not issue a refund if requests are made more than 90 days after the fee was required to be paid. So in a case where a firm estimated revenues at year end and needed to revise the calculation based on the actual financial statements once they receive it, we expect firms to recalculate that within 90 days and file an amended form. Um, to request a refund if necessary. If um, a firm forgets and it comes about two years later, the firm won't be eligible for a refund. And another amendment is with regards to uh, indirect avoidance of the rule. And this is outlined in Section 8, 2.8 of the Companion Policy. Um, it indicates that firms must pay participation fees based on all revenues that are attributable to capital markets activities in Ontario. Uh, so there's certain, uh, we have seen certain structures that firms have set up where management fees are being paid to an unregistered related entity. Uh, because the registered firm is the one that's performing these registrable activities, it, all of the revenues that are earned from these activities should be recorded in the registrant level and not in an unregistered entity. As a result, we require all these firms to uh, amend their structure and also to record these revenues as part of their participation fee calculation. Uh, in terms of uh, some good news with respect to participation fees, uh, the amendments now keep the participation fee rates the same as last year. Um, so in the old fee rule, uh, the, the participation fees were scheduled to increase slightly year over year. But based on OSC's review of the participation fees and the fees that OSC receives, uh, they decide to keep the participation fees rates the same as last year. So as a result, on this slide, you'll see that the participation fees have remained exactly the same, and it will remain the same for every year going forward as long as this fee rule is in effect. So for 2015, these are the fees that you expect to pay depending on what bucket your firm falls under. And then for next year, for 2016, the same thing applies. Uh, the fees will remain the same for 2017, et cetera, until the fee rule is amended. Uh, next, we'll, now, now that we've discussed the amendments, I'll go into the filing requirements, and I'll tie in these amendments and show you how it all fits in. 
Uh, I apologize if the following slides appear to be very basic or if it seems like I'm reading from the slides. Uh, we wanted to include sufficient info on the slides so that you can use this presentation deck as a reference for when you complete and file your participation fee calculation and pay your fees. Um, so hopefully this, this will be useful for everyone. Uh, in terms of general requirements, uh, these are all the same for all firms. So for registered firms, for firms relying on the international dealer, international advisor exemption, or unregistered IFMs, uh, everyone's required to complete Form 13502F4 uh, online through uh, the OSC website. And I'll provide you with the link at the end of the slide deck. Um, in terms of the deadline, all firms are required to file this online participation fee calculation by December 1st. Um, if you have your firm's information for the financial year ending in 2015, you can go ahead and file it before December 1st, but the filing deadline is latest December 1st or else late fees will apply. Um, after your firm has filed the participation fee calculation, uh, your firm has to pay the participation fee. So in terms of the payment deadline, this is December 31st. Um, so just a distinction, your filing deadline is December 1st and your payment deadline is December 31st. In terms of how your firm will pay, um, if your firm has a NRD has a bank account that's associated with NRD and linked to NRD, the fee will automatically be pulled on December 1st or the next business day after, um, and the firm doesn't have to do anything else. All you have to do is ensure that the bank account that's associated with NRD is the correct account, and there's sufficient funds in that account to not only pay the participation fee, but uh, any fees owing to other regulators. Uh, and the firm will be able to identify that in your NRD profile. Uh, for any firms that do not have a bank account associated or linked with NRD, uh, these are the FT exempt firms, you're required to submit your participation fee to the OSC via check or wire transfer. And in this case, um, instructions are provided on the OSC website with regards to what to include uh, with the check and wire transfer. But in general, we expect the firm to provide um, the firm name, the NRD number, uh, the purpose of the payment, for example, 2015 participation fees, uh, the submission number for your calculation that you filed online, um, and this will help identify what the payment relates to and we'll be able to link it to your firm if um, your firm's participation fee is being paid on by a, your law firm or an agent for service, for example. Um, so in terms of late fees, if your firm files a participation fee calculation late or your payment is late, uh, the firm will be subject to late fees. And this is outlined in section 6.4 and section 3.4 of the fee rule. Uh, the late filing fee, if your firm files late, is $100 per business day. So it is quite a hefty fine um, and it is to a maximum of $5,000 or $10,000 depending on whether your uh, firm uh, revenue is for last year. Um, so we do highly recommend that you file it on time. Uh, in terms of late fees with respect to the late payment, if you pay after December 31st, um, if you attempt to pay and there's an issue with your payment, uh, we don't consider that uh, paid on time. Uh, so once the firm successfully pays and if it's paid after December 31st, there is a, a late payment fee, which is 0.1% of the outstanding participation fee for every business day that's late. So if the firm forgets to pay and pays mid next year in 2016, it would be 0.1% of whatever is outstanding. For example, the minimum amount of 835 times every business day that the payment was late. Um, with regards to unregistered IFMs, these firms had a different filing and payment requirement under the previous fee rule, uh, which was 90 days after the end of the financial year. As a result, there was some transition language that's built into the, the current fee rule to address this issue. Um, so that if your firm is an unregistered IFM and you're not registered or relying on an exemption in other, any other category of registration, uh, your firm will fit into one of the two examples that I have here. So in the first case, uh, unregistered IFM that has a financial year ending between January 1st, 2015 and April 5th, 2015, um, you would have had to file your participation fee calculation and pay your fees within 90 days after the year end uh, because this was under the old fee rule. Uh, because you did pay for 
pay fees for a 2015 financial year already, uh, you would not be required to file again or pay a fee come December 1st or December 31st of 2015. Um, for other firms, if your firm had a December 31st financial year end, for example, um, for your December 31st, 2014 calculation, you would have had to pay that fee and file the calculation within 90 days after that year end. So that would be somewhere between uh, somewhere in March 2015. In this case, although you paid and filed the fee in 2015, it actually relates to your 2014 financial year. As a result, for this under the new fee rule, you would also have to file a uh, 2015 participation fee calculation by December 1st and also pay that associated 2015 participation fee by December 31st. So it, the firm will be paying and filing twice in 2015, but it actually relates to 2014 and 2015. Um, as, as we discussed previously, all firms are required to calculate participation fees using their previous financial year, which is your financial year ending in the then current calendar year. So for 2015, it'll be 2015. 2016 will be 2016. Uh, we've provided a few examples uh, of how to calculate your fees and what year to use. Um, so all your firms, all firms should fit under one of these examples here. So in our first scenario, we have an EMD that was uh, registered in 2010, and they have a financial year end of March 31st. Uh, for the 2015 calculation, you would use you would calculate participation fees based on your financial year ending March 31st, 2015, and the firm would have had audit financial statements by then, so you would be using actual numbers in this case. In our second scenario, we have a firm that is uh, in, set up March 2012 and also registered as an AFM back in 2012, and in this case, the firm has a December 31st year end. Um, in order to calculate the 2015 calculations, the firm is now required to use a financial year ending in 2015. Uh, because the firm's financial year is December 31st, 2015, what the firm will have to do is come December 1st, they would have to estimate revenues for the, fi the full financial year from January 1st to December 31st uh, because the firm doesn't have that December numbers. So in this case, if the firm files a, based on an estimate and once the actual financial statements come, uh, the firm is required to internally recalculate the participation fees using the actual numbers. And if that causes the actual participation fee to change, revenues can change and that's fine. But if uh, the revenues cause your actual payment to change, you're required to file an adjustment form, which is Form 13502F5 online within 90 days after the firm's financial year end. And that will require the firm to either pay an additional amount or request a refund if the fee has decreased. In our third example, we have a firm that's relying on a permitted client exemption available under a multilateral instrument 32102, and these are your unregistered IFMs that we're referring to. And in this example, the firm has a December 31st year end as well. So under the previous fee rule, as we just discussed earlier, uh, the firm is required to file the 2014 participation fee calculation within 90 days after the year end. So for a December 31st year end firm, the firm would have had to file and pay the fee by March 2015. Uh, this relates to the 2014 calculation. So as a result, come December 1st and December 31st of this year of 2015, the firm is still required to file another calculation and pay another fee. Um, so in this case, for the 2015 calculation, the firm would calculate fees based on financial year ending in 2000, uh, ending December 31st, 2015. Again, in this case, because of a late financial year end, the firm has to ca uh, estimate revenues for the financial year. And if the actual calculation changes and the firm owes additional fees or is eligible for a refund after reviewing the annual financial statements, uh, the firm has to file an adjusted form online as well. Uh, so now that we've described the filing requirements for all firms, uh, we'll walk through the actual calculation itself, the participation fee calculation, and most firms will be using Form 13502F4. And we'll also discuss some of the common errors that we typically see, and hopefully uh, these can be avoided when you're filing and paying fees. Uh, so just to summarize again, the calculation is required to be filed 
annually by all firms. So as long as your firm is registered or relying on an exemption from registration, the participation fee is required to be filed and paid. If your firm is solely registered under the Commodities Futures Act, as for example a commodities trading manager, uh, you're required to file what's called Form 13503F1, which is the participation fee calculation under the Commodities Futures Act fees rule. However, uh, if your firm files Form 13502F4, we would also accept that in lieu of the Form 13503F1. For the purposes of this presentation, we'll talk about Form 13502F4. Um, so when you go on to the online calculation, uh, which we'll, I'll give you the link to afterwards, uh, the first thing you'll notice is that uh, the Chief Compliance Officer certification is now at the front of the form. And so the, the purpose of this is because we want the firm to have the CCO review the calculation before the firm enters all the information onto the online form, and this is to ensure that the CCO has in fact reviewed the calculation prior to it being submitted. Uh, after the CCO certification, there's some general information about the firm. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, we do suggest that you uh, make sure the CCO information is accurate because this is the contact. Uh, the CCO will be the one that will be contacting if we have any questions on the participation fee calculation. Uh, so all firms are required to select a membership status. So we'll go through each of these, and uh, if your firm is a member of the MFDA, regardless of whether you're registered in any other category or relying on an exemption from any um, category of registration, uh, you should select the first one, which is an MFDA. Uh, this brings up a separate form on the next page on the online form, so it's important to identify the correct uh, membership status. Uh, similarly with IROC firms, if your firm is an IROC member and you're registered in any other category, uh, you will select that your firm is an IROC member and there's a separate IROC participation fee calculation as well. If your firm is not an MFDA member or an IROC member, uh, there's two other categories that you'll fit under. If your firm is solely an unregistered investment fund manager, um, you would click that section. And if you're, for most of you, uh, if your firm is a registered firm or relying on an international dealer or international advisor exemption uh, or any other category of registration, you would select all other firms. And this brings you up to another participation fee calculation. In terms of financial information, uh, this will depend on whether your firm has a late year end or not. Uh, because your calculation is due December 1st, there are some firms that may not have completed their financial year ending 2015. So if you have, say, October, November, December year ends, you might not have your audited information yet. And as a result, you may have to provide an estimate. And if this is the case, um, you would select, is your firm providing a good faith estimate under Section 3.2 of the rule? You would select yes and the year end would be your financial year end. Uh, because all firms are required to use a 2015 year end, we've actually hard coded the year on the online form. So you will see as you go in, it'll say 2015. So all you need to do is enter the month and the day of your financial year. Um, if your firm has an earlier year end, so if somewhere from January to say September and you have your audit financials already available, you would not need to estimate anything. So as a result, in number four, you would select no, that you are not providing an estimate. Um, so after you've selected your membership status and you, you fill out the information from the previous screen, uh, for IROC firms, you will now come to this page here, which is your participation fee calculation for IROC firms. Uh, you would base your total revenues off of your IROC form, audited IROC form one, uh, or statement E, which outlines the revenues for the firm. Um, the way it works is you uh, report your total firm revenues and then you back out any revenues that are not considered capital markets activities. So as we discussed, uh, any activities that require you to be registered, um, relying on exemption, or if it or those activities were in Ontario, it would require you to be registered. Um, anything that doesn't fit into those categories, you can back out. So for example, it could be consulting income that doesn't require you to be registered. Um, and then you apply an Ontario percentage to get you down to the allocation to Ontario, and that's what you would pay your participation fees off of. Um, we'll go into more details with regards to the line items on the subsequent forms, 
uh, please note that this form is only for IROC members. Uh, similarly, if you selected you are an MFDA member, you would come to part two, which is the MFDA participation fee calculation. And again, it's very similar to the IROC one where you'll base your total revenues off of your uh, MFDA form one or statement D of the financial questionnaire and report. And again, you back out any revenues that are not considered capital markets activities, and then you apply an Ontario percentage to get you down to your revenues in Ontario uh, that are subject to those participation fees. Again, this is only for MFDA members as well. Uh, for all other firms, so if you are a not an MFDA member or an IROC member, you're required to fill out Part 3, which is this form here. And at a high level, um, I'll outline how it works. Um, line 1, you would report your total revenues for your 2015 financial year. And then there's certain deductions that you can take. So you back out any revenues that are not considered capital markets activities. Uh, lines 3 to 6 include deductions that a firm can uh, remove from the calculation if your firm does qualify for those deductions. And then finally, you apply an Ontario percentage to your subtotal, which gets you to your Ontario revenues. Uh, and that's the amount that you will base your participation fee off of. In terms of common errors that we see, um, before we go into the line-by-line -line detail, uh, we'll outline, we've outlined a few uh, common errors. And typically, we do see firms that use an incorrect financial year to calculate participation fees. Uh, because all firms are now required to use 2015 financial year, we've hard-coded it as 2015, so hopefully that will make it easier for everyone to know that you will be basing your participation fee calculation off of your revenues from your financial year ending in 2015. Uh, the next common error that we see is for firms that have estimated revenues for the year, uh, we've found that some firms have not been recalculating internally once their audited financial statements become available. So it is a requirement for you to internally calculate, recalculate, and if your participation fee changes as a result, uh, your revenues may change, but uh, if your participation fee doesn't change, you're not required to refile a calculation. However, if your participation fee does change, you're required to file an amended form 13502F5, and then you'll be required to pay an additional amount or request a refund at that time. Another common error we've found is uh, for firms that have revenues that are denominated in a, another currency other than Canadian dollars, they have not been converting the foreign currency into Canadian dollars. So firms are required to convert to Canadian dollars using the daily noon exchange rate from the Bank of Canada website as of the reporting date. So for example, if your firm has a March 31st, 2015 year end and it's in US currencies for your revenues, you would take the daily noon exchange rate from the Bank of Canada website uh, for March 31st, 2015. Um, for firms that have a late year end, December 31st year end, because you have to file the form by December 1st, um, there will be no FX exchange rate as of December 31st since it didn't occur yet. So what you would do is when you're completing the form, on the day that you complete the form, uh, you can use the daily noon exchange rate from the Bank of Canada website on that date to convert the foreign currency to Canadian dollars. Uh, so now we'll go into the line by line detail and we'll outline um, the requirements and some common errors that we've seen. Um, so if you want, you can follow along with the uh, part three of the form in the previous slide, and that we'll go through line by line with that. So line one requires a firm to report gross revenues per, for the previous financial year. So what we require from firms is you should report the total revenue from the firm's audited financial statements. Um, if a firm reports certain revenues on a net revenue basis, you should report it on a gross for the purpose of the calculation. Uh, firms are required to have financial statements that are non-consolidated. So if you do consolidated financial statements, registered firms should report revenues on a non-consolidated basis so that you're not capturing revenues from um, other, other registered firms that are also filing participation fee calculations. Some common errors that we see is that revenue doesn't agree to the audit financial statements. Um, in, in the case where a firm estimated revenues, it may not agree but uh, the firm should recalculate 
based on the actuals when the financials are available. But if you do have audit financial statements to work off of, uh, it should match with your revenue line item. Um, we've seen other errors, uh, other arrangements that are in place where clients pay management fees to uh, a registered firm's unregistered parent company. And in this case, uh, these revenues aren't being recorded on the revenues participation fee calculation. Because the registrant is doing the registrable activities, we do require these revenues to re be reported in the registrant firm itself. And in terms of the structure, the revenue should be recorded on the registrant's financial statements because they're the ones doing the activities as well. Um, in some other cases, there's firms that are operating on a cost recovery model. And in this case, there are no revenues that are recognized. It's just a recovery of expenses on the financial statements. Um, if your firm fits under this category, if you're a not-for-profit, for example, please come speak with, uh, please email staff and we'll let you know how to calculate the fees. But we do expect these recovered costs to be recognized as revenues. Uh, so once you've reported all of the firm-wide revenue, the next line allows you to duct, duct out any revenues that are not considered capital markets activities. And what we mean by that is there are certain revenues that a firm may have that doesn't require them to be registered or relying on exemption from registration in order to, to conduct. And these examples are could be consulting revenue, um, which doesn't require a firm to be registered, or maybe interest income on some cash that the firm has. Um, that they earned. Um, common errors that we see are on this line item, we see firms that are deducting out any revenues that are not Ontario related. And as a result, uh, when they get down to applying the Ontario percentage, uh, it actually dilutes the revenue even more and is not reflective of the actual Ontario revenues. Um, so lines three to six allow for some additional deductions on top of uh, the other deduction on line two, and we'll discuss these in detail as well. Uh, line three is redemption fee revenue. So firms may earn redemption fees if an investor sells units in a fund before the redemption fee period expires. And in this case, the firm typically recognizes revenues, but it, with redemption fees, many times these fees are paid to the mutual fund companies and the registrant essentially records revenue and then pays out as an expense. Uh, as a result, these redemption fees, uh, if a firm does have them, is eligible to be deducted and not included for the particip participation fee calculation. We don't see this often at all. Uh, the next line is administration fee revenue. Um, so if, if a firm pays the operating expenses for a, an investment fund and administration fees are charged to the investment funds. Uh, what happens is a, an amount equal to a reasonable recovery of these costs for those operating expenses can be deducted on this line. So in some cases, a registrant will set up with the fund so that the registrant pays all of the operating expenses of the fund. The fund then has an agreement to pay uh, a fixed cost to the registrant firm. So as a result, the registrant firm reports these administration fee revenues and the registrant firm also has associated operating expenses that are paid out. As a result, these are not true revenues for the firm because they are essentially paying, it, paying expenses on behalf of the fund. And as a result, we do allow a deduction to be taken on administration fees. Um, some operating expenses could include bookkeeping and administration fees, uh, marketing costs, legal fees, audit fees, custodian fees for the fund. And it has to only relate to the fund. That's important to note. Uh, the next deduction that's permitted is for advisory and sub-advisory fees that are paid to other registrant firms or exempt international firms. So in some cases, a registrant firm will uh, have an agreement in place so that another registrant firm sub-advises on a portion of the assets that are managed by the original registrant firm. So in this case, what happens is the client pays the registered firm for management fees and the registrant firm pays another registered firm. Uh, to sub-advise. And as a result, the other registered firm also has a requirement to file participation fees. So on that other registrant firm, they're reporting revenues, but so is the, the registered firm that's, uh, that has the clients. So as a result, um, both registered firms are reporting on the same revenue from clients. 
Uh, in this case, we want to prevent the double counting of revenues, and so we permit the initial registered firm to deduct out the sub-advisory fees that are paid to another registered firm. And uh, it's important to note that this deduction can only be taken if the registered firm reports the revenues and an associated sub-advisory fee paid out. Uh, similarly, uh, with trailer fees, uh, there may be situations where trailer fees are paid to other registrant firms, and again, this is to prevent double counting of revenues. Um, so in the case of a registrant firm that reports revenues and pays out a trailer fee, uh, that trailer fee can be deducted for the purposes of the participation fee calculation. Um, so once you've added up all the deductions, essentially what you have is you start off with the firm's total firm-wide revenue, you backed out any revenues that don't require the firm to be registered uh, or relying on an exemption, and then you backed out some additional deductions that prevent uh, to avoid double counting, and now you've arrived at what we call revenue subject to participation fees. So these are your firm-wide revenues that require the firm to be registered or relying on an exemption. Next, what happens is um, you have to reduce these revenues to just the Ontario portion of it. So the firm has to apply the Ontario percentage for the 2015 year. As we discussed previously, your firm will calculate the Ontario percentage based on three ways. Um, if your firm only has a permanent establishment in Ontario, you would put 100% as your Ontario percentage. So all of the revenues that you earned will be attributable to Ontario and you'll be paying participation fees based on this. Uh, for firms that have a permanent establishment or uh, office or branch in Ontario and somewhere else, you would base this off of the corporate tax return. So it's a percentage of taxable income that is taxable income earned in the year in Ontario. So you would take a look at your Ontario taxable uh, corporate tax return, and it's typically on Schedule 5. You would uh, determine the Ontario taxable income divided by your firm's total taxable income. Um, if a firm doesn't have a permanent establishment in Ontario, then you base it off of revenues, and it would be total revenues that are earned in Ontario divided by the total firm revenues to arrive at the Ontario percent, uh, these revenues for the, uh, that are subject to participation fees. Uh, so common errors that we've identified is uh, firms are calculating the Ontario percentage incorrectly, and they may be basing it off of the number of clients, or AUM, but this isn't reflective of the true Ontario percentage because there, you may have a, a very few clients in Ontario, uh, but represent 99% of the firm's revenue. So basing it off the number of clients is not reflective of the dollar amount that the firm is earning in each jurisdiction. Uh, where firms file corporate tax returns, we notice that firms aren't um, calculating the Ontario percentage correctly or are not using the taxable income to calculate their fees. And if the firm does have a permanent establishment in Ontario um, and elsewhere, we expect the taxable income to be used. Um, so after you've applied the Ontario percentage, you, you arrive at what's called the specified Ontario revenues. And this is the amount that you would look into the schedule that we looked at earlier to determine how much in participation fees your firm will have to um, pay. And I'll show you on the next slide. So, for example, if based on your total revenues and your deductions and your Ontario percentage, um, say your firm fit in, your firm had specified revenues of 500 to under 1 million, your firm would have to pay participation fees of $3,550. And the participation fee is due December 31st for everyone. Again, uh, just to go back again, with regards to payment, uh, for firms that have a bank account associated with NRD, it will be automatically withdrawn from the firm's bank account, um, and just make sure you have sufficient funds in there. And for firms that don't have a bank account associated with NRD, please pay by check or wire transfer. Uh, if your firm had a late year end, and at the beginning you had to estimate the revenues for the firm, uh, once you the firm obtains the audit financial statements, there is a requirement under the fee rule to recalculate the participation fees based on the actual financial statement numbers. Um, in most cases, it probably won't cause your participation fee to change. Your revenues may change up or down, uh, but in most cases, your fee itself won't change. If it doesn't change, you're not required to file 
an amended form to the OSC. You just have to maintain your internal calculation on the records just in case the OSC selects your firm for review and you can provide evidence that your firm did recalculate internally and that there was no change. Um, in the case where your firm estimated revenues and the actual revenues caused your participation fee to actually change, in this case, your firm is required to file what's called Form 13502F5, which is the adjustment calculation. And you can file this through the OSC website using an online form as well. And the firm will be required to recalculate the entire participation fee calculation. But before the firm submits, you'll come to this next page, which is the adjustment form. And um, in terms of each of the lines, the estimated participation fee paid is the fee that the firm initially calculated by December 1st and paid by December 1st. Um, the actual participation fee is based on the adjusted calculation and it'll show either a higher amount or a lower amount and the refund due or the balance owing is just the difference. And if the firm owes money, the firm will be required to make a payment on NRD or pay by a check or wire transfer for the additional amount. And if a firm uh, is has a refund that is due, OSC will um, issue a refund check to the firm. Uh, so with regards to review of participation fee calculation, the OSC on an annual basis performs reviews of these participation fee calculations to ensure that it is accurate, accurately done and the firms are paying the correct amount. Uh, in terms of how these firms are selected, we have both a random sample of firms and targeted samples if we identify uh, specific issues with the firm's calculation. Um, this includes the review of new register firms. Uh, we do want uh, a selection of new register firms. We do want to make sure the new firms are calculating it correctly right off the bat. Uh, in terms of what your firm should be able to provide us if your firm is selected for a review, uh, you should maintain a signed copy of the participation fee calculation. When you file your calculation online, it's just an online submission. Um, you don't have to file us uh, file with us the signed copy as well. We do recommend that you print a copy of your online calculation and keep a signed copy for your records. And if we, you, we were to select you, you can provide the signed copy. Uh, we would request audit financial statements for your audited MFDA Form 1 or your IROC Form 1 to make sure that the revenues tie in with the calculation and any deductions taken tie into your financial statements as well. Um, if you have deductions that are buried inside the financial statement line items. We expect you to have a breakdown of these deductions to show how you arrived at these deductions and be able to demonstrate that these deductions are appropriate. Uh, and we do expect you to maintain backup for the calculation of the Ontario percentage. So if you have a corporate tax return, we would expect you to provide your corporate tax return, um, specifically the section uh, Schedule 5, which outlines the taxable income, and show us how you calculate the Ontario percentage. Um, if you base your Ontario percentage off of revenues because you didn't have a permanent establishment in Ontario, we would expect you to provide us with that breakdown of the revenues that are attributable to Ontario. Um, so now that we've gone through the calculation, um, as most of you are aware, um, some jurisdictions have signed a memorandum of agreement with respect to a cooperative capital markets regulatory system. So we just want to give you a quick update on this CCMR. Um, so a memorandum of agreement was signed between the Federal Department of Finance and certain jurisdictions. And the most recent ones are BC, New Brunswick, Ontario, PEI, Saskatchewan, and Yukon. And the MOA sets out certain conditions in order to implement a cooperative capital markets regulatory system. And uh, the purpose of this is to set up a uniform legislation for all firms that are participating in these jurisdictions, they would follow one act and um, they would just report to the CMRA. In terms of how it affects all of your firms and fees, uh, the intention is to set up one fee regulation for all uh, jurisdictions that are participating in this cooperative capital markets regulatory system. And the fee is meant to be a single simplified fee structure designed to allow self-funding of the CMRA and hopefully it doesn't impose unnecessary disproportionate costs on all firms and market participants. Uh, so this mandate has remained the same as last year and there's not much else with regards to the fees that we can, uh, that we are aware of at the moment. 
Uh, so lastly, we just want to provide you with some references. Uh, the first one is with respect to the OSC fee rule. So if you have any questions with regards to the participation fee calculation or any of the amendments um, and you want to identify the specific section that it relates to, we have a link to OSC Rule 13502 fees and along with the companion policy which provides guidance on other aspects. Uh, for the purpose of this presentation, we didn't go through all of the fee rule amendments. So there are amendments to certain activity fees and to other items. Um, so we do highly recommend that you take a look at the OSC fee rule and have a read through it to see all of your other requirements that a firm may have. Uh, we also provide a link to the Commodities Futures Act fee rule, and this is for firms that are registered under the Commodities Futures Act. Uh, there are separate fees that are required um, in terms of activity fees, so we do recommend that you take a look at this if your firm is registered under the Commodities Futures Act. Uh, lastly, we provided a link to the OSC's Forms and Documents page, and th on that page you can actually access the online calculation for the participation fee calculation and for the CFA participation fee calculation as well. You'll be able to access the adjustment calculation, which is Form 13502F5. Uh, we recommend that you uh, keep that link as a reference because it does identify other forms and documents that a registered firm or an exempt firm may need to file with the OSC, and it provides you with uh, details of those particular forms and documents, and it provides you with a submission method, whether it's online, through an email, through NRD. Uh, that link will provide a chart that shows you all of that information. Uh, please note that that link isn't an all-inclusive list of everything that a firm is required to do. So firms should understand the requirements under the Securities Act and the various other regulations. Um, and this is only meant to be a guide for firms. Uh, so that concludes our, our presentation. Uh, if you do have any questions that we didn't answer, feel free to email the Registrant Outreach Seminar, uh, outreach email that's outlined here. And if you have any questions um, specifically, you can contact the OSC Contact Center, and they will be able to either answer your question or redirect you to the appropriate person. Uh, so I hope this presentation was helpful for everyone. Um, in filing your participation fee calculations come December 1st and paying your participation fees come December 31st. Um, and if you do have any questions, again, feel free to email the link. Thank you very much for participating. And if uh, you have any other questions or if you want to know what other sessions are available, please go on to the Registrant Outreach website through the OSC website and you'll be able to find what other seminars and presentations that we have upcoming. Um, if you are not a CCO or UDP and you want to sign up for the OSC's Registrant Outreach subscribe, uh, subscription service, we do send emails to uh, the subscribers on a periodic basis with information relating to uh, regulatory issues and compliance issues. If you want to sign up for that, please go to the OSC's Registrant Outreach website and you'll be able to sign up to receive emails. So I hope everyone enjoyed this presentation and I hope found you hope you found it useful. Thank you very much.